Chapter 61, Academy Days Part 20, Next Generation Once the joyous news spread throughout their friendship circle, Hinata received wave after wave of guests, most only briefly dropping by to say their congratulations. From their closest friends and teachers, to the union ambassadors, to fellow clan leaders. No one wasted any time to give their best wishes to the family, some already dropping gifts for the parents-to-be, and some even meant for the baby, like toys and clothes. Among the first, however, was someone Naruto expected to sit back and wait for things to blow over. Much to his surprise, Sasuke visited them in broad daylight and through the front door. A rare occurrence lately as Sasuke prefers to not really be a major presence around the streets. The two opted to sit on the roof rather than the comfort of the couch, although looking over the lively Uzumaki compound is relaxing in its own right. Once sat on the tiles, Sasuke warlessly offers a closed fist. Naruto looks at him in confusion, but grins when he realizes the intent and returns the fist bump. Congratulations. Truly. Thanks. I seriously still can't believe it's happening. You've changed so much these past 10 years. Sasuke looks over the newest clan's district. First leading a revived clan, now becoming a father. Who would have thought? Not like you're that different. Naruto chuckles. You're a whole different person too. Yes, well, I had someone knock some sense into me. Sasuke leans back, taking in the clear skies above. If you hadn't beaten some sense into me, I don't know where I'd be right now. But I know I wouldn't have been this. He pauses, trying to find the words. Happy? I guess that's part of it. Feels a bit more complicated than that. It usually isn't. Naruto shrugs. You might just be overthinking it. He taps him on the shoulder. I might be. From below, a familiar voice grabs their attention. What are you two doing up there? Sonata calls out to them. Peering down, they see the Hakage and her cousin, Fusuma Senju, standing in front of the house. Granny, Fusuma, hey. Naruto waves to them. We're just hanging out. Is Hinata home? Fusuma asks. We bring gifts. She's taking a bath, but I got a few clones in there so make yourselves at home. Sasuke stands up from his spot. I'll just take my leave. You see to your guests. You know, Fusuma speaks up before he can go. You don't have to leave. We haven't had the chance to speak and I'd like the chance to. We don't have much to speak about, do we? Sasuke says bluntly. Fusuma laughs at his openness. No, but it all starts with something small, doesn't it? There's been a lot of bad blood between the Senju and the Achiha. I wasn't in a position to do anything about it back then, but I can at least do something now, no matter how small. Come on, man. Naruto pats him on the back as he stands up. It'll be fun. Sasuke sighs. All right. Naruto grins and flickers down to the ground where Tsunade immediately drapes a hand over his shoulder and locks his head in her arm. You've been taking good care of your wife, kid? Of course I have. Naruto grumbles. Sasuke follows him down, exchanging a nod with Fusuma, as the two follow inside the Uzumaki family's home. First month, May. From practically the moment they received the wonderful news, Naruto became Hinata's shadow every step of the way. Wherever she went, he'd be around to make sure she doesn't overexert herself to the point of fainting again. On the plus side, that does mean he insists on doing more chores more often, so it's not entirely a bad thing. His help even extends to something as simple as reaching for a cupboard to get a glass. Here you go. Naruto reaches from behind her to get the glass she was about to get. Thank you. She takes the glass from him with a faint smile. I really appreciate everything you're doing dear, but I can do this much on my own. Yeah, I know. I just don't want to risk something like that happening again. That happened because I didn't know I'm pregnant, but now that I know. Naruto looks down to the ground in defeat. You're right. I'm sorry. She caresses his cheek and kisses him on the nose. I love you. He smiles and kisses her back. Love you too. Mom. Dad. Katori's voice comes calling from the front door, just now returning from the academy. I'm back. She comes running into the living room, followed by Yakamaru and Shoto, who walk at a more normal pace. Hello, sensei. Yakamaru waves. Good evening. Shoto bows as he tends to do. Pardon the intrusion. Hello, you too. Hinata greets them. What brings you here? We wanted to see how you were doing. Shoto answers. Yakamaru nods. You don't feel ill again, do you? Hinata chuckles. Now you're sounding like Naruto. Katori leans over to them and stage whispers. Dad's been really overbearing lately. I heard that. Naruto protests. Would you like anything to drink? Hinata offers. I don't think we'll be staying for long. Shoto looks to his friends for confirmation. 
Yeah, Katori answers, we're gonna go play with Mirai and Tama. They really like hearing stories and seeing Jutsu. Yakamaru smiles. That's very kind of you. I'm sure they'll appreciate you spending time with them. Oh. Yakamaru remembers. Mom wanted to invite everyone to dinner at home next week. You and your parents too, Shoto. That'd be awesome. Naruto grins. Been a while since we all got together. Second month, June. Two regulars at the Uzumaki residence have been the Hataka and Yumino, providing a great deal of support for their little makeshift family. They often bring little Azuki and Shahei around, seemingly growing with each passing week, even though they really don't. It won't be long before the toddlers are all grown and moving around on their own. With Shizunin and Anko spending time with Hinata in the living room, Kakashi and Aruka take Naruto back to the yard, where a large wooden statue of the Uzumaki couple decorates the scenery. You know you need to give her space, Naruto. Aruka laughs. We've been through this. Hinata's more patient than Anko, I can tell you that much. Kakashi adds. Naruto slumped his shoulders. Did you two come here just to tease me? More to give advice. Aruka pats his adoptive son on the back. I know everything you're gonna say already, alright? I'm not dumb. I just... Kakashi finishes the sentence. Want to show her how much you care. Yeah, we know. But that also comes with a limit. Aruka adds. She doesn't want to feel like a burden, either. It's just who she is. It's just... I feel like I wasted so much time, you know? She's been cheering me on since we were kids, but I was too stupid to notice. I gotta make up for it. Iruka leans and smirks. I thought you said you weren't dumb? Naruto snorts and smacks him on the leg. You know what I mean. I do. Iruka pulls him into a hug. I can assure you she doesn't feel that way. Kakashi reassures him. You don't have to prove anything, Naruto. Just be happy together and love each other. Fourth month, August. As much as Hinata wouldn't like to admit it, it's already becoming more difficult to do everything she usually does. Tiredness comes much more easily as her belly grows, and Naruto has gotten even more protective, doing everything he can to make sure she's not overexerting herself. At times, his worry for Hinata's safety almost feels supernatural. Currently, he and Katori are in the yard practicing, and there's a good few rooms between them. When a sudden jolt in her belly makes her yelp in pain, she immediately sits down on the couch, not wanting to faint as she did before. She looks down at her stomach in disbelief and feels around where she felt the jolt. Hinata. Naruto immediately rushes into the room after hearing her discomfort. Supernatural. What happened? He kneels down in front of her and holds her hand. Is mom okay? Katori runs in a bit after him, unable to even come close to his speed, especially when he's worried. I'm fine, I promise. Hinata reassures. The baby kicked. I felt it just now. She says with the whitest of smiles. For real already? Naruto presses his ear against her belly, trying to feel the baby. Katori jumps over the backrest of the couch to land next to her mom. Is this the first time it's kicked? She asks with excitement. It is. At first I was so certain, but it was definitely the. She stops mid-sentence with a light gasp. Ah. Naruto snaps his head away, grinning wildly. It kicked again. Lem see, lem see. Katori now presses her ear against Hinata's belly, impatiently waiting for another kick. Her enthusiasm drops after a bit of zero movement. Nothing? That's okay. Hinata brushes her hair. There'll be plenty more where those come from. Naruto kisses and rubs her belly. Soon, buddy. Just wait a bit more and you'll kick all you want again. Ah. Katori starts pounding him on the shoulder. Stop hogging all the fun moments. She presses herself against a belly again. Round two. This time, it doesn't take long for her to feel a kick herself. Satisfied, she lifts her head and rests her head on Hinata's shoulder, grinning the whole time. Naruto kisses his beautiful wife on the lips and his lovely daughter on the head, and sits on the couch, embracing them both. Fifth month, September. While Hinata has received many guests over these past months, and even gotten advice from the more experienced Kurenai, Shizune, and Anko, over the months, it's come to light that she's not the only one pregnant. Her classmates and friends have also progressed their relationships, with Tenten finding out she's pregnant with Lee's child, not long after Hinata did, and Sakura and Ino only a couple months after that. They've taken to regularly meeting for a chat, or as regular as they can, given Hinata and Tenten's more advanced stages of pregnancies. On one random day, Hinata opens the door to find all three of them in front, carrying takeout. Oh no, had we agreed to lunch? Hinata looks between them in a panic. No, we hadn't, don't worry. 
Sakura calms her. Eno and I just grabbed Tenten and thought to come pay a visit. If. That's all right, of course. Yes, of course, come in. She steps aside to let them all enter. I wish you'd called earlier, I could have made something for us. We know. Eno chuckles and wiggles the takeout box. That's exactly why we didn't. You overdo it when you don't have to. Tenten gives her a quick hug as she enters. It's why Naruto's such a mother hen. I'm not that bad, am I? Hinata mumbles to herself and closes the door, heading into the living room where Sakura and Ino are already going through the familiar ritual of setting up the food for a day of movies and mindless entertainment. As usual those two do the majority of setting up, while the more heavily pregnant Hinata and Tenten are pushed to rest despite their numerous protests. You two sit back and rest, we got this. Ino scolds them, herself not even showing obvious signs of pregnancy, being still in her second month. Sakura, in her third month, already has a bump growing. Are Naruto and Katori home? They're out training with Yakamaru and Shoto. They should be back in the evening. Perfect. Tenten exclaims. That gives us plenty of time to eat everything in existence. I'm surprised Naruto let you out of his sight. Ino teases. Sakura laughs. Like you're one to talk. Isn't Kiba even worse than Naruto? That's... Ino stumbles over her words. That's neither here nor there. She looks away, prompting Sakura to laugh. Honestly, that's super sweet. Tenten smiles. Of all the people, I didn't really think those two would be the most attentive. The Inuzuka clan value friends and family above all else. Hinata says. It's just who they are. They feel the joy of a newborn much heavier than most. Yeah, I've noticed. Lady Tsuman and Hana have been around a lot, too, offering to help. Still miss my privacy, though. Ino sighs. What about Lee and Sasuke? Lee is... Well, Lee. Tenten gives a hesitant laugh. He's as enthusiastic as ever, it's just his enthusiasm has shifted to the baby. He and Gai-sensei already have a training schedule. You have my sympathies. Sakura pats her on the shoulder. Sasuke's. Trying. I think he was expecting the news even less than I was. He's not sure what to do. Well, he better figure it out. Eno crosses her arms. He can't stay uncertain forever, he has a family to take care of now. Just say the word and I'll smack him over the head. That really won't be necessary. Sakura laughs. I'm just glad you two realized where you stand. Hinata smiles. To think just a few months ago you weren't certain about the two of you. You don't have to bring that up. Sakura puffs out her cheeks. Seventh month. November. When Naruto opens the door to a series of consistent knocks, he's met by Kurenai carrying a couple bags and Mirai continuing to knock on the doorframe. That's enough, dear. Kurenai moves Mirai's hand. Okay. Mirai enthusiastically says before running into Naruto and hugging his legs. Naruto laughs in response. Hey, Mirai, Kurenai-sensei. He leans down to pick up the girl glued to his legs. He can hardly believe just how big she's gotten, at nearly four years old, it feels like only yesterday that they visited Kurenai at the hospital after the birth. Is the baby here? Mirai asks. Not yet, no. Naruto answers with a laugh. Oh. Mirai looks down, dejected. The baby will be here soon, Mirai. Kurenai brushes her daughter's hair. Be patient. So what brings you here, sensei? Naruto looks at what she's carrying. I come bearing gifts. She holds up her bags. When they get inside to the living room, they're met by Hinata sitting on the sofa with all the possible comfort in the world. Multiple blankets for extra softness, pillows so she can have a cushion any way she chooses to sit, a smaller pillow on the table if she needs to lift her feet, and even an ottoman if she wants to rest her feet there. Naruto lets Mirai down and walks over to her and kisses her on the top of the head. Do you need anything else? Hinata looks around at everything around here. I think I'm fine, Naruto. She says with a chuckle. I'll say. Kurenai laughs. I was thinking of asking how you were, but I'd say you're doing fine. Naruto has made sure of that. The man in question begins walking away. I'll be in the yard if you need me. So just call, okay? I will. He abruptly walks back to the sofa, leaning over it to look at Hinata. If I don't hear, just call again. I might, I'll be fine, dear. She pats him on the cheek. Kurenai sensei is here with me. Right, yeah. He finally walks out the room. Kurenai watches their interaction with a wide smile. How things have changed from when you gave him that healing salve, huh? Hinata looks away blushing. You don't need to bring it up. Meanwhile, Mirai looks all over the room, watching and listening for any signs of the person she primarily came here for. Is Katori here? I wanted to play. I'm sorry honey, Katori's at the academy. She'll be back later, though. 
I'll tell her you were looking for her, and she can go play with you. Can Tama come, too? Mirai asks for her friend. Of course. Yay. Mirai plops herself on the sofa next to her mom. Kurinai then opens the bags, revealing their contents to Hinata. I found some of Mirai's baby clothes. I figured you could make use of them. Don't worry, they're unisex, so your boy won't look weird in them. Sensei, that's so kind. You really didn't have to. But I want to. I might have more for you soon. I've saved some for when we find out if Kiba and Shino will have boys or girls. I'm excited to find out as well. January 21 on the fateful day, Yuzumaki family experienced a level of joy and love they'd never thought possible, the joy of holding their baby in their hands and becoming closer than ever. Hinata lies in bed with her baby, all wrapped up in a blanket, still wondering if this is all reality. It feels far too good to be true, being with her love, being this close with her father and sister, having an amazing daughter and now son. The more she plays with her baby and the more he clutches onto her finger with all the strength he can muster, the more it sinks in just how real it is. Naruto's distinct blonde hair and twin whiskers on each cheek, and Hinata's pale eyes makes the boy the perfect combination of his parents. Naruto sits on the bed by her side, wrapping an arm around her shoulders and admiring his son. He's perfect, she says, sniffing and wiping away what tears escape his already puffy and reddened eyes. He leans down to kiss the newborn on the head and his wife on the lips. Thank you. For loving me, for giving me a family. He looks around the room at the overly excited Hanabi and Katori and the trying to be stoic Hiyashi. For showing me what it means to be happy. I should be the one saying that. She brushes her hand against his cheek. You gave me strength when I had none left, and you keep giving me strength when I thought I didn't need any more. She holds the baby toward Naruto, prompting him to take their son in his arms. Naruto very awkwardly holds the bundle in his arms. His face is contorted, trying his absolute best not to cry, although from his puffy eyes, it's obvious he's already done plenty of that. My son. Naruto kisses his baby boy on the nose, eliciting a soft giggle. My beautiful son. Katori walks up to him, hugging him tightly and resting her head on his shoulder to look into the blanket to her baby brother, taking in his light blonde hair and pale eyes. Hey, little guy. She gently runs her finger over the two whisker marks on his cheek. So you got daddy's hair and mommy's eye. You're gonna be a real lady killer. She giggled. Hanabi walks behind Naruto and rests her head on his shoulder. I wonder who you'll take after. She coos at the boy. Will you be gentle like your mother, or reckless like your father? Boy. Naruto protests. The girls surrounding him chuckle at his expense. Hinata reaches over to hold her husband's hand. He can be both. Gentle toward his friend, and reckless when he needs to support them. You always have to find the middle ground, don't you? Hanabi puffs out her cheeks before turning to the man stood at the front of the bed. Father, come say hello to your grandson. Hiyashi tentatively steps toward Naruto holding the bed railing until the very last possible moment. He tries to keep an air of dignity but is betrayed by his eyes, puffier and redder from crying than Naruto's. Naruto stands up, breaking away from Katori and Hanabi who were glued to him while admiring the baby. He stands sideways by Hiyashi's side, allowing him to look at his grandson. The sight of the baby sends the usually stoic man into a fit of crying. He takes him off Naruto with slightly shaking hands. Hello, little one. Hinata and Hanabi smile at the sight of their father openly showing his true feelings. Hanabi sits down on the bed, leaning on her sister's shoulder. So what's his name? Hinata in turns rests her head on top of Hanabi's. Hiroto, she answers. Hiroto Yuzumaki. February 1. With all the pride and joy he has, Lee holds his son up above his head. This is, he says through waterfall tears, the happiest day of my life. All right, I get it, now please put metal down. Tenton tries to get him to handle the baby with care. He's still a newborn, we should handle him with more care. Right, of course. Lee does just that, taking his son into his arms and sitting on the bed next to Tenton. I simply couldn't help myself. I know Lee. Tenton laughs. But we need to be careful with him, all right? He's our precious son. That he is. I hope Neji will watch over him as he watched over us. I'm sure he will. Tenton smiles. March 13. Hidden Sand Village. The joyful news spread quite quickly among the sand that Kankuro, the Kazakage's older brother and most trusted advisor, is to become a father. The relationship with his current wife, Mitsuri, started off somewhat odd. It was no secret that Mitsuri was one of Gara's greatest admirers, and as she rose through the ranks, she was placed in a position of trust by the fifth Kazakage, 
and she had to work with Kankuro on numerous occasions. Slowly but surely, Mitsuri grew to realize what a different world Gara lives in and just how much pressure he's under, especially by the elders. Her hero worships faded and she began to see him with more sympathetic eyes and normal levels of admiration. That, in turn, allowed her to see other people's true worth. Normal conversations with Kankuro became more frequent before turning into a regular thing they both looked forward to. Those became dates which flourished into a relationship, all leading to the moment where they both hold their son. Hello Araya. Kankuro, on one of the rare occasions where he doesn't have his warpant on, commands a miniature puppet to dance on his wife's shoulder, drawing Araya's full focus. Can you say Dada? It's way too early for any of that. Mitsuri laughs. Knowing his dad, his first word might be puppet. That's literally my dream. He jokes. Whatever his first words, Gara interjects, him, Tamari, and Shikamaru standing by the bed to give the couple space with their son, I'm certain they will come from a place of love. 100 Ryo says his first word will be something completely random. Tamari bets. You're on. Kankuro grins. Shikamaru shakes his head. Is that what you guys' priority is? Pretty much. They both answer in unison. I just hope Araya can get along with his cousin. Mitsuri looks to Tamari's belly, still not really showing any visible signs. How far along is he? Still seven months to go. Tamari subconsciously places a hand on his belly. It might be difficult because of the distance, but I hope they can grow close. Do you know the gender? Gara asks his sister and brother-in-law. Not yet. Shikamaru shakes his head. Sakura says the baby needs to develop a bit more until tests can show anything. I've always hoped for a girl first, but we'll see. I'm surprised. Tamari raises a brow. Knowing the women in your life, I'd have thought you've had enough of that. Are you acknowledging you're troublesome? Shikamaru chuckles. Damn right. Tamari laughs. If my dear brother's any indication, Araya will be better behaved than the hellion I'll give birth to. Kankuro snorts. That's because I had you two as siblings, no way was I gonna act out. Gara looks down to the ground with a pang of guilt. I'm sorry for everything I put you through. Come on, man, I was just kidding. Kankuro reassures. All's good now. He looks down to his sleeping son. All's perfect. Mitsuri leans her head on Kankuro's chest, trying not to disturb Araya. March 31. One of the more unexpected pregnancies followed, although only the couple involved were unsure of their status. Everyone else basically already knew they were an item and only wondered when these two would realize it. Turns out, Sasuke and Sakura realized it when they found out they're soon-to-be parents, and today, they meet their baby girl. After spending some time in her mom's arms, the baby is now being gently rocked by the grandmother. Mibuki rubs her nose against the baby's, emerald eyes locked with small obsidian beads. She has her father's eyes. She asks. Kizashi hovers around them, rocking his head back and forth, the jiggling of his hair sending the baby in a fit of giggling. Haha, <laughs> still got it. This always had Sakura laughing, too. Yeah, but then I learned better. Sakura laughs. So, Mibuki looks at the two parents. Are you finally going to tell us her name? Sakura exchanges a confirming look with Sasuke who's stoically standing by the window. Kami. Her name's Kami. Kami Haruno, huh? It's nice to meet you, dear. Not Haruno, mom. Kami Achiha. Sakura corrects her. That's so? Mibuki holds baby Kami up to look both at her and her dad simultaneously. I guess she does already resemble an Achiha more. She walks over to Sasuke, offering him to hold his daughter. Hopefully she'll get her facial structure from her dad, too. She chuckles. What's that supposed to mean? Sakura puffs out her cheeks in annoyance. Mibuki carefully places Kami in Sasuke's arm, who has to struggle a bit to get her in a good position. All right, now, she reaches over to guide Sasuke's left arm, but freezes at the very last second, remembering the very obvious problem with that. She winces when she realizes what she just tried to do. Sorry, I didn't think. It's fine. Sasuke reassures her with a smile, one not really directed at her but to his beautiful daughter, who his gaze is intensely focused on. I sometimes forget it's missing, myself. Looking to his side, at the empty sleeve, he has an idea. Something he's never tried before, but something that might be worth trying. A red pattern swirls around in his typically dark eyes, forming into a six-petaled flower. Susano chakra manifests in his sleeve, sending it billowing as if blown by a harsh storm. From within, a glowing spectral hand emerges, resembling a purple skeleton. A human-sized version of his jutsu. He goes to try and hold his daughter with both his hands, but as soon as the admittedly terrifying construct goes near her, she begins crying. 
eyes whitening from shock and fright, Sasuke immediately deactivates the jutsu and looks around in a panic. Granny Mabuki steps in to take Kami from him and rocks her again in an attempt to comfort her. I didn't. Mean to, I just. Sasuke stumbles to find the words. It's okay. Sakura reassures him with a smile, extending a hand toward him, which he steps closer to take. It's actually reassuring you can be this awkward, too. She adds with a laugh. May 1. The sight of Kiba that only a very select few people know about is just how clingy he is. Naturally, something like that would ruin his reputation as a cool badass. Right now, however, he doesn't care one bit. He's lying next to Ino on her hospital bed as she holds their daughter in her hands. He can hardly contain his excitement, going from laughing from joy at the sight of his daughter and kissing his lovely wife and back. Ino giggles at his extreme displays of affection. Down, boy. How can you expect me to settle down? Kiba questions. This is our baby girl. We made her. He brushes their daughter's sandy blonde hair. Akamaru wags his tail besides the bed, his head resting on the sheets. Some drool may or may not be falling on it. Suma laughs and turns to the other woman in the room, dressed in an elegant green dress and light brown hair tied up in a bun. This is what you'll have to deal with, Megumi. You ever want to return him, just say the word. Megumi laughs softly. No, I think he'll fit quite well in the Yamanaka clan. Such dedication is a wonderful thing, Suma. Ha. If you say so. Hana walks over to the bed, holding out her arms to the baby. Can I hold her for a bit? Of course. Ino carefully hands over the bundle girl to her aunt. Hana bares her teeth at the newborn, making silly faces. Inobi Yamanaka. You're going to be a real troublemaker, I can already tell. Show them that in Yuzuka spirit, yeah? Akamaru lifts himself up from the bed and sits around Hana to observe the baby. Actually, we were thinking, Ino exchanges a knowing look with Kiba, both nodding in confirmation, before turning to Tsuma, we'd like Inobi to learn both our clan's jutsu, but I'm not sure how odd that would be. Not at all. Tsuma shrugs. It's been done before, you don't have to stick her with just one clan's heritage if that's what you want. It would just need both clan leaders' approval, and, well, that's us. She laughs. So I'd say that's set. Megumi walks over to get another look at her granddaughter. Besides, I don't think your father would like his granddaughter to be denied her own birthright. With this, our families can come closer than ever. Damn straight. Suma claps Megumi on the back, a little harder than the other woman was expecting. Welcome to the family kid. She scratches Inobi's nose, grinning widely. July 7. The Aburama clans vary. Unique physiology doesn't allow them to show much emotion. When they get overly excited, the kakechu that reside within them respond to the change in chemicals, and it's possible to lose control of them. With age, it's entirely possible to control the insects so they don't act just from the shift in emotions, but by that point the Abu Rama have grown so used to keeping their emotions in check that being emotional is a somewhat foreign idea for them. On this day, Shino is caught between wanting to explode from emotion and wanting to keep it in as he's always had to. Shibi places a hand on his son's shoulder. You're strong, Shino. You can be happy. You've nothing to fear. Yes, comes a distracted response. Shino steps closer to the bed where his wife and son currently lie. Shiho smiles and turns the blanket so Shino can take a closer look. Look, Shichi, that's dad. From under his coat, Shino tries to contort his muscles into what looks like a smile. As he leans over to greet his son, hello, Shichi, the baby starts crying at the sight of him. Startled and embarrassed, Shino pulls back. Shiho rocks the baby to shush him. There, there. It's all right, honey. Dad's just awkward sometimes, he's not scary. Shibi chuckles and pats his son on the back. You had the same reaction. I did? Shino raises a brow. The crying Shino? Shiho chuckles. Now that I'd like to see. That would be inadvisable. Shino looks away with red and cheeks. Once Shichi calms down, Shiho turns back to Shino. Do you want to try again? Without the weird face this time. She adds with a light laugh. Shino just nods and sits down next to her. He brushes a single finger against his now calm son's nose. Hello, son. Welcome to our family. August 8. Chowza spins around the room with great delight as he holds his granddaughter. The excitement had gotten too much for him, and now he doubts if he'll even be able to put down the adorable little bundle in his arms. He admires her cute features, the darker skin and golden eyes she got from the mother, and the ginger head of hair that's seemingly a mixture of both her parents. She's already as beautiful as a butterfly. 
the boys won't be able to resist you, will they, Chow Chow? Dad, you're gonna make her dizzy if you keep spinning like that. Chow Ji warns with a chuckle. She's an Akamichi. She's made of sterner stuff than that. Chow Zha walks over to the band to hand Chow Chow back to mom. Karui takes her and fixes her blanket, making sure she has enough room to breathe. Nah, that's definitely the cloud blood in her. It can be both. Chow Ji compromises. If anything, I just hope she gets her mom's loving nature. If she can help someone like you've helped me. I've done nothing of the sort. Karui shakes her head. You're an incredible shinobi and an amazing person. You just needed someone smarter than the leaf girls to see that. She smirks and rubs his chin, fingers brushing against the goatee he's been growing for a while now. Aw, oh, I don't know if I'd go that far. Chaoji rubs the nape of his neck in embarrassment. I told you, Chaoji. Chaoza smiles. You'll meet someone to appreciate you. Thank you, Karui, for coming into our family. October 13. Tamari is as stiff as a board as her daughter lies in her arms. She'd been taught a lot about what to do after the childbirth, and it's somehow everything went flying away. Is? Is this how you're supposed to do it? Seeing his wife's distress, Shikamaru laughs and takes the baby off her for a second. So even you get nervous, too, huh? Shut up. She blurts out and looks away embarrassed. Shikamaru smiles at his daughter, brushing away her sandy blonde hair. She's a lot calmer than I thought she'd be. So was I when I was a kid. Tamari laughs. Just you wait. Shikasa Nara. Gara smiles from his seat in front of the bed. Either way, she'll have a great source of love. A bridge between our two villages that shan't be shaken or broken. Yoshino walks over to see her granddaughter. I can promise you that will be the case, Lord Kazakage. Please, you may call me Gara. We are family now, after all. No, I couldn't possibly. That'd be so rude of me. He's right, mother. Tamari smiles. We're family. To us, that means more than you might know. Yoshino looks with uncertainty between the two siblings. Well, if you insist, Lorum, Gara. He nods in response. I'm just sorry that Kankuro couldn't make the journey. He is busy, after all. Shikamaru says. His own son is probably a handful. Tamari nods. I'm honestly surprised you were cleared to travel. I do have an important meeting with the Hakage, after all. Of course, we haven't yet decided what that meeting is for, but I'm certain we can find something. Gara answers honestly. Tamari laughs. Well, look at you, twisting authority. Shikamaru lowers the bundle to hand Shikasa back to her mother, who takes her again, this time with a bit more ease. See, it's not that difficult. I don't want to hear any lectures from you, mister. Tamari warns him. Yeah, yeah. November 3. Sai's entire childhood was spent in a rigorous regime. His every movement, his every action, his every thought was dictated, and he had to obey every word given to him. He had nothing and was nothing. That all began to change when he was given the fateful mission of keeping watch over Naruto Uzumaki, whose energy and attitude began cracking Sai's dark world and shed light where he'd previously lost all. Meeting Yakumo, he felt that darkness fade away even more. He was making friends, he was building relationships, he was doing anything he wanted. He was on his way to becoming human. Today, the moment he held his son in his hands, every trace of his old self disappeared. For probably the first time, he feels alive. Or rather, he feels. His shackles are gone and there's only one thing going through his mind. Kensu. He says his son's name, almost still in disbelief that he's been granted this blessing. I will make sure you never have to lead the life I led. Sai declares through tears, finally realizing that crying isn't bad, that it doesn't cloud your judgment. It can be a magnificent driving force. Yakumo wraps her arms around his waist as he sits on the bed by her side. I can't imagine what you went through in the route, but I can promise you that's over. Both you and Kensu will lead the life you deserve. She reaches up to gently wipe her fiancé's tears, despite her beginning to tear up. I will not be a burden to you. Either of you. You couldn't possibly be. Yakumo smiles. We share in everything, both good and bad. That's what a family is. It sounds lovely. Sai leans down to kiss her on the lips. When they break away, Yakumo smiles. And it only gets better. December 22. Karen lies in her hospital bed, unable to take her eyes off the baby boy sleeping soundly next to her. Opposite her son is her husband, looking down to the both of them with a loving gaze. Jugo reaches over to cup Karen's face, slowly stroking her cheek with his thumb. He's beautiful. He says in a soft voice. Karen smiles and kisses his palm, leaning further in for his caresses. Girls are beautiful. Our dear Chihehi is handsome. 
is that so? He chuckles. I'll keep it in mind. He pulls back his hand, fingers lingering ever so slightly before parting from Karen's cheek. He kneels on the ground and rests his elbows on the bed, focused on his son with a soft but troubled expression. What's wrong? Karen asks, noticing his more somber than usual behavior. I just hope she doesn't inherit my clan's keke genkai. I don't want her to live isolated like I did. Jugo admits his fear. I know it hasn't been easy, but Shahei has something neither of us ever did. A loving and caring environment. He'll have you and Naruto to teach her how to control himself, and, hey, maybe this Uzumaki blood of mine will help out somehow. Karen grins. He'll be just fine. Yeah. Jugo returns the smile. You're right. I suppose I'm still getting used to the thought of being in a safe place. I'm aware I wouldn't normally have been your first pick, but Karen shushes him with a finger over his mouth. Don't. I was a dumb, broken kid before. But you helped me become someone I can be proud of. Someone who can be a mother. You did that all on your own. Jugo leans over to kiss Karen, an act eventually interrupted by the crying Chihei. Hidden Mountain Village Today is a day of mourning for the people of the Land of Woods, or more specifically, for the people of what was once called the Land of Rice Paddies. Everyone was overjoyed when the shinobi leader Kaitamaru Sakata and their princess Makoto announced they were a couple, they saw a bright future for their two nations with this union. They were even more overjoyed when Lady Makoto announced her pregnancy, further cementing the bright future that awaited them. During the Land of Rice Paddies' most troubled times, when they were left defenseless and powerless following Orochimaru's death, she was the shining light that gave everyone hope that things would get better. To everyone's utter shock, that light has been snuffed. Today, they gather to mourn the death of Lady Makoto and her unborn child. Kaitamaru, leader of the mountain village and her husband, offers his prayer to the nameless deities that watch over them, except he's one of the few who knows their actual names. Everyone sheds tears at the sight of the unfortunate man who lost his lovely wife, they can only imagine how much that's affected. Kaitamaru remains silent throughout the entire funeral, keeping his head low and with an ever-present blank stare. It hurts the people to see him like this, when he and Makoto were always so full of life when they were together. For the whole duration, Lady Ujiri, daimyo of the Land of Woods, stays firmly by his side. Even in mourning attire, she keeps her elegant appearance, face trying to remain stoic and dignified. At the end, Kaitamaru and Ujiri leave together, prompting many gossiping eyes to follow them with suspicion. Isn't the lady getting awful close to him? Even at the funeral. One person notes. Another person smacks them over the head. What are you blabbing about, you idiot? They're family, of course they're close, they are? I had no idea. Another scratches their head in confusion. Their names are Kaitamaru Sakata and Ujiri Sakata, how could you not? So they're like. Brother and sister? Cousins? Yeah, I don't think I've heard anyone talk about those two. I dunno, Lady Ujiri looks a bit older than him. And, maybe? She might be older but still looks really fine, though. Dude, are you seriously thirsting after your daimyo at a damn funeral? The man shrugs in response. A larger group of people approaching forces them to disband their little huddle, going back to the hole and trying to pretend they weren't just gossiping. Inside his office, Kaitamaru props himself against a wall with a heavy sigh, his legs feeling like they're about to betray him. The solemn look on his face remains as it did before. Yujiri walks over behind him and wraps her arms around his waist. Don't tell me you feel regret. This was always the plan, my love. She was just a means for us to obtain Arachimaru's assets. Nothing more. After a moment of silence and hesitation, Kaitamaru finally answers in a whisper. Yes, of course. She never would have approved our plans or what we must do for the Uzumaki clan. And soon, Yujiri steps in front of him, never letting go of him, we won't need to pretend anymore. Once everything is in motion, we can be together as we should be. She cups his face, pulling him to lean down so she can kiss him deeply and intensely. However, she quickly breaks away, realizing her passion isn't returned in full. She glares at him in anger. Don't tell me you actually felt something for the girl. She grips his face tightly. Don't tell me you've forgotten our love, Kaitamaru. I could never, yay. He winces slightly in pain, but places a comforting hand over hers, prompting her to loosen her grip. You never once left my thoughts. I simply mourned the child, thinking what it would be like. His lips begin to curl into a smile before a sudden thought enters his mind. He furrows a brow, trying to piece together a picture. Although? Didn't we have? No. Yujiri cuts him off with a harsh voice and a cold stare which softens once she realizes her voice might have cut deeper than she intended. We've never had a child, dear. 
If we did, he'd obviously be here with us. Right, obviously. Kaitamaru shakes the thoughts out of his head. I'm not sure where that came from. Rest. I'll not return to the capital for another two days. We can plan our next steps in the meantime, and. She brushes her hand against his chest as she moves to leave the room. If you truly wish for a child, we can accomplish that, as well. She adds with a seductive smile. Once alone in his office, Kaitamaru walks to the window, looking out to the village he's spent so many years building and strengthening, all for the moment where he can achieve his victory. In the reflection, he sees not only the village outside but himself inside. He wipes away a single tear shedding from his left eye. For the Uzumaki clan. Kaitamaru Uzumaki declares. End of chapter 61. Name meanings. Hiroto Uzumaki equals great flying. Named after Ogata Shumahiro Yuki, folklore hero Jureya's real name. Kami Achiha equals from the Yakai Kamatachi, making her named after Itachi. Megumi Yamanaka equals grace, blessing. She's an anime only character but was never given a name. Inobi Yamanaka equals Ino equals boar, and Bai equals tail. Following both her parents' families' naming conventions. Shichi Abu Rama equals seven. Shikasa Nara equals Shika equals deer. Sa equals sand. Kensu Karama. Named after Kensaun equals cloudless sky, following the Karama clan naming convention of cloud formations. Chihei Uzumaki equals Kai equals seek. Hai equals peace. Trivia. Hiroto's birthday is January 21 because that's the release date of chapter 383, the final chapter, and where Jureya died. Kami's birthday is the same as Sarada's, but March 31 is also the release date of chapter 394, Sasuke's victory, where Itachi died. Inobi's birthday is the beginning of May, because that's usually around when the flower viewing custom, Hanami, ends. Shichi's birthday, 0707, is just a pun on his name. Shikasa's birth month, October, is when the deer of Nara City have their antlers annually filed down. Kensu's birthday, November 3, is culture day in Japan when, among other things, artists are celebrated. Metal Lee shares a birthday with Brandon Lee. Similarly, Rock Lee shares a birthday with Bruce Lee, November 27. Terui, Derui Samui, Yurui, Amoi Hakui, and Araya, Kankuro Mitsuri, are all characters who appeared in Boruto during the Chunin exams. I just stole them and changed their origins. Author's Note Hiroto and Kami's names are ones I picked out nine years ago when I first came up with the idea for this fic, long before Boruto. Naruto Next Generations ever existed. So I decided to keep them instead of using the canon Boruto and Sarada, because of how long they've been in my head, and I've grown attached to them. If it gets slightly confusing, I apologize. Shikasa exists instead of Shikadai because of Shikamaru's dream life he mentioned during the Chunin exams, of wanting a daughter first and then a son. Don't worry, Shikadai will exist, too, he'll just be a bit younger than in canon. Chapter 62. Academy Days 21. Genin. Ms. Shina. I'm really sorry I haven't kept in touch, but no not a day goes by that I don't think of you and everyone in Tsuji. I've been more than well. I have an amazing mom and dad, and now I have a younger brother too. I was really blessed when they came into town. I can't think of a family I'd rather be a part of. Dad's a clan leader and mom's a representative for the Hidden Leaf. They're tough jobs but they're really good at it. And Hiroto, that's my little brother, is so cute. He's already really big and getting super active and adorable. I can't wait to see how he grows up. I also made plenty of lifelong friends all over the lands. They're all really fun and awesome in their own ways. I thought always traveling would get kinda lonely, but that wasn't the case at all. It was always fun and interesting. Today, I finally become a shinobi. It's no longer just a dream. There's still a lot I don't know about my jutsu, but I've learned a lot. I can't wait to show you in Takeo and everyone else. I hope everyone in the orphanage is doing good. I miss you all so much. All the love, Katori. Yuzumaki Household. Katori puts her pen down just as her alarm clock rings. She'd set it to wake her up at a certain time, but ended up getting up all on her some time ago. She's been wishing for this day ever since she found out she has a unique jutsu of her own, and finally getting to achieve that dream is nerve-wracking. The past four years have been an adventure for her to say the least. 
Growing up at an orphanage with only her name as a remnant from whoever she used to be, she never thought her dream would come true, no matter how much she wanted it. Then, she not only found a family to call her own, but she had the privilege to be taught by a lot of people and make a lot of new friends. Today, she can stand proud as a shinobi. After training with Naruto and Hinata, and then at the academy, it's finally time for her to show the world what she's made of. With her predetermined time for starting the day having begun, she puts down the pen, closes the letter, and gets up to prepare. She washes up, brushes her teeth, combs her hair and ties up in a ponytail as she usually does. Her attire consists of a mesh shirt to protest her body, with a simple shirt that has the Yuzumaki clan emblem on the back, and dark pants. On her arms, she puts on fingerless gloves up to her elbow, mostly there so her arm guards can comfortably stay in place. Similarly, she has leg guards on, as well. She ties her supplies pouch to her back and her kunai pouch to her leg. Finally, she takes her forehead protector and ties it around her head, grinning into the mirror like mad. Even though she wore it yesterday when she passed the graduation test, this is her first time with her attire for her career as a genin. An official ninja, finally. She skips out of her room and down to the living room, where Hinata is sitting on the ground beside the sofa. The table is pushed to the side, giving young Hiroto enough room to maneuver. He's standing on his own two feet although he still needs the sofa for the occasional support. When Hiroto sees Katori he immediately begins babbling and tries to walk to her at a faster speed than he should. Hinata stands up to walk behind him, straightening him when he begins to wobble. Katori runs up and picks her bro, kissing him on the tummy which sends him into a fit of giggles. Hey there, buddy. Gonna send me off. Hinata smiles as she takes a closer look at Katori's new jetup. You look incredible. Of course, she's seen the clothes before as she was present when they were made, but it's still a touching moment to see the young girl all geared up. I feel incredible. She pumps her fist. I can't wait to go out there and do stuff. Traveling with you and dad, all I could do was sit back and watch, but now I can act. Oh, honey, Hinata hugs both her and Hiroto and kisses her on the top of the head. You've been brave from the very beginning. Risking your own life to save Takai and Kitsui? Helping people when that large black creature attacked? Standing up for Jugo? You've been acting this entire time, now you can just do it better. Thanks, mom. Katori snuggles into her embrace. Is dad around? He left early. Special Jonin meeting before the teams are officially announced. He'll meet you at the academy. Then I'll get going. I gotta meet up with Yakamaru and Shoto. She gives Hinata one more hug before going for the door. Waiting a second to see if Katori will realize a mistake she'd made, Hinata clears her throat when that doesn't happen. Katori? Yes, mom? Katori turns around. Hiroto? Hinata says plainly. It's only then that Katori looks down and realizes she's still holding the toddler in her arms. Oh, oops. She gives an abashed laugh and hands Hiroto back to mom. Take care, dear. Hinata laughs as she takes back the toddler. I'll drop off Hiroto with Sakura soon and join you. Will do. Katori gives Hiroto one final kiss on the head and leaves the house proper this time. Now with both her husband and daughter out of the house, Hinata has some before she has to leave herself. She goes over a mental list of everything that needs doing and turns around to start. Much to her surprise, she sees Naruto, dressed in his full shinobi gear, standing in the living room and holding a folder. Naruto? She cocks her head. What are you doing here? I kinda. Forgot something? He rubs the nape of his neck. So I sent a clone to grab it. Was that Katori leaving? It was. Hinata nods and walks over to him. She's really excited for this. I'll bet. Naruto wraps an arm around his wife and son as they approach. You good to go, too? Hiroto garbs onto his dad's orange cloak, tugging at the collar. In a bit. I have to get Hiroto changed, and I'll leave. That's nice. Naruto wraps his other hand around them, breathing deeply at the homely comfort. Shouldn't you go? Hinata chuckles but snuggles into him despite her prompt. In a bit. The original's over there, so he's got it covered. It can wait. He says in a wistful tone. Naruto. She scolds him in return. He grumbles. Yeah, all right. Work is work, right? He takes Hiroto's small hands and kisses them before he turns to walk away to do his job. Could you deliver a message to the real you? Yeah, sure. He turns around to look at her. Only to be pleasantly surprised when she lifts herself on her toes to kiss him on the lips, hand gently stroking her cheek. When they break, Naruto stands there in stunned silence for a bit before grinning. Consider it delivered. Wonderful. She giggles as the clone heads out. Now she can continue with her preparations. Teshin Household Shoto was by far the one to awake the earliest from his home. 
He spent most of the time in meditation to calm his nerves, combined with some light exercise to get his blood pumping. His usual routine involves running and practicing his kata, going through the different forms of his clan's fighting style. Whether it be from nerves or from being far too absorbed in his routine, but morning comes and goes before he even realizes. It's already got to be time, right? He immediately rushes back to his room, scaling the side of the house to get to the second floor, instead of using the stairs as normal. Inside, he goes for a particular shelf in his wardrobe where he'd stored his outfit last night. A guy similar to what students of the shore in Ryu wear, except this one's dark rather than the usual white. It's fashioned from sturdier stuff to endure on whatever harsher missions they may be sent to, with a protective mesh shirt underneath, the pants being tucked into his boots and wrapping bandages around his right arm. The last thing he has to add is, wait, where is it? He could have sworn he put it with the rest of the outfit. He rummages through his entire wardrobe, hastily pushing aside the normally well-folded and stacked clothes. No, no, no. Where is it? He panics internally. Did it fall under the wardrobe somehow? He checks there, too. Nothing? Under the bed? Not there, either. Outside? He peeks out the window to find, once more, nothing. As he grows more anxious, he makes more noise in his turning over every piece of furniture. Enough noise to attract attention. Shoto? Asami knocks on his door. Is everything all right? No, Shoto shouts from inside. Concerned, Asami opens the door and enters. What's wrong, honey? I can't find it, mom. My forehead protector. It's nowhere in here. Oh, that? Your father took it? Asami says. What? Shoto whips his head around, on the verge of tears. Why would he do that? Well, he. Asami begins explaining, but her words fall on deaf ears as Shoto runs out the room at blinding speed. Oh dear. Shoto runs through the entire house, checking every room his father would most likely be in, until he finally finds him, sitting on the floor in front of a table with his back turned to the door. Dad, did you take my forehead? It's then that Shoto notices a piece of green cloth on the floor, the very same one he'd attached his protector to. He can even see the marks where it used to be. What did you do? What did I do? Itasuke turns his head around, hands still fiddling with something on the table. What did you do? You know how much work goes into rising through the ranks of our empty hand style. We all wear our accomplishments with pride. I'd have thought you'd do the same. Itasuk grabs something from the table and hands it back to Shoto. It's his forehead protector, except attached to a blue cloth, rather than the previous green. This is a blue belt. Shoto tentatively steps forward and takes it. Within the empty hand martial arts, the level of one's progress is displayed by the color of their belt. That shows their level of skill and how long they've been studying the art. It's a great honor to advance in the ranks, and that comes with setting expectations for those who strive to attain the level of skill the belt holder has. Everyone starts with a white belt, then advancing to yellow, orange, green, and then the level Shoto is currently at, blue. The final three ranks are purple, brown, and black belts. Itasuke and Asami are, naturally, black belts. When it comes to pure martial form, you've still got a lot to learn. Itasuke says as he stands up, straightening his back. However, when applying everything you've learned on your journey thus far, you easily outrank any practitioner of karate, the empty hand, I've seen. Father, I don't know what to say. Shoto looks down to the blue cloth in disbelief. Itasuke looks into his eyes, noting the simmered down fear and anger that were present when Shoto entered the room. Did you think I'd thrown it away? Shoto clasps his mouth shut. The thought did actually cross his mind. Itasuke chuckles lightly. No, I don't blame you. Perhaps I held Shinobi in too much disdain over what happened to our clan, but this is where we belong. Or at the very least, where you belong. Show them what the empty hand is capable of, son. Shoto bows deeply. Yes, father. Standing by the door, Asami smiles at her men placing their trust in each other. It's almost time to get going. Ah, right. Shoto looks out the window, noting how much time has passed. He has to meet up with Katori and Yakameru before going to the academy. Contrary to its name, he ties the headband around his waist, using it as a belt to hold his guy in place. Asami walks up to him and straightens his shoulder-length hair, taking it all into her palm. She helps put it up in the traditional topknot that the men of the Teshin clan wear. You look very handsome. She hugs him before he goes. I'm proud of you, Shoto. Thanks, mom. He returns the hug. With that, he's ready to set out. Kagatsu Household Yakamaru is similarly excited for the day ahead, although not one to really wear his emotions on his face. 
some mistakenly think that he's not as happy as others when he actually is. It's just difficult for him to express outwardly what he feels inwardly. Thankfully, he found friends who understand him and accept him. Starting today, they won't be just friends anymore. They'll be teammates, partners. Shinobi. To that effect, he gets dressed in the plans to wear during his career as a genin. Or until he grows out of them. One or the other. It's a simple attire, really. A plain gray hoodie with somewhat loose pants that are tucked into his boots. Over the hoodie, he straps on a leather harness that essentially acts as a bandolier, having several small scrolls tied to it. On the front of the harness, on a larger piece that covers his chest, is a stylized lotus flower. The last bit he dons are a pair of fingerless gloves that Katori insisted they all wear to be their common threat as a team. He doesn't particularly mind and there's a part of him that thinks they look pretty cool. Then, of course, is the most important part. The forehead protector that he ties around his head. Satisfied, he heads out of his home to the yard they share with Gurin's house. When he leaves, he's met by his entire extended family. Looking at literally everyone gathered together like this makes him realize how lucky he's been to lead the life he currently leads. Yui is the first to step forward, kneeling down in front of him and brushing his hair. Look at you, all grown up now. Your dad would be proud. Thanks. He smiles and hugs her tightly. You actually look like a real shinobi now. Gurin laughs, herself fully dressed in the hidden leaf uniform. The only bit of accessorizing being a green cloth that flows from the bottom of her flak jacket with a lotus flower, resembling her old kimono she used to wear. Gozu stands by her with his everyday clothes, and between them. Little Byakuren and Jayuji who immediately run to their cousin. Where are you going? Please come back. Don't worry, you too. Yakamaru laughs. I'll still be around. He pats them both on the head. Promise? Byakuren looks up to him with puppy eyes. Promise. Yukimaru comes over and pats his brother and sister on the head. Come now, you know Yakamaru has his dreams, right? We all want him to be happy. Yeah. Both kids look down to the ground, digging into the dirt with their shoes. Yakamaru steps forward where Tiuchi and Ayam agreed him. When you get your team sorted, how about you stop by Ramanichiraku, huh? It'll be my treat. Tiuchi offers with a smile. I think Naruto would do that, anyway. Ayama giggles. Yeah. Yakamaru says. He finds any excuse to have us eat there. Can still hardly believe it. Tiuchi looks off into the distance. That little kid now has little kids of his own to take care of. You're telling me. Gurin laughs. I still remember when we were trying to kill each other. Fun times. I guess. Everyone has their own story, huh? Yakamaru chuckles nervously. By the way, Gurin notes his harness. Is that a... The lotus? Yeah. The boy nods. I styled it after the one you wear. Should I not have? He looks down to the emblem on his chest, running his fingers across the stitching. No, it's fine. Gurin kneels down in front of him and pats him on the head. It actually means a lot to me. Thanks. But why are you dressed like that? He asks. This? She looks down to her uniform. I have a mission after your ceremony. I am a shinobi of the leaf, remember? And now you're one, too. Show him what's what, yeah, will do. With that, Yakamaru proudly heads off for the academy. Somewhere else. Two figures sit atop a particular water tower they designated for a meeting spot. One's orange cloak billows against a wind, while the other's open book's pages turn on their own, prompting him to close it shut for later reading. Kakashi looks towards the academy with a nostalgic look in his eyes. Naruto Uzumaki. Jonin Sensei. It has a nice ring to it, don't you think? Naruto chuckles. Sounds weird when you say it like that. Been preparing for this day for four years, and yet I'm still nervous. Does it go away? No. Kakashi answers bluntly. Naruto looks at him from the corner of his eye. You're terrible at pep talks. The older man laughs in response. You're never really been one who needed them. No matter what the odds were, how dangerous it was, you'd jump in head first and do it, anyway. You're a skilled shinobi and the kids love you. You've been training them for four years, so just keep doing what you've been doing. That's a little better. I do have something for you to give to the real you. Kakashi rummages through his pocket to pull out something small wrapped in a red napkin. Naruto takes it with a quizzical look and opens it, only to see two small bells attached to red strings. Are these? The ones you tested us with? Yep, the very ones. Consider it a present, from one sensei to another. Naruto takes the bells in his palm and plays around with them with his thumb, a soft ringing as they move. Do you think? I should give them the bell test, too? Kakashi shrugs. That's up to you. I gave you a test because there was something I needed to learn about you. 
The question you need to ask yourself is, is there anything about those three you need to learn? He pats Naruto on the back. It's up to you what you want to do with your team, right? Naruto nods. I'll give them to the real me. Think about what I want to do. Whatever conclusion you come to, it'll be the right one for you. Kakashi stands up and dusts himself off. Trust in your judgment as you always have. With that final piece of advice, Kakashi's shadow clone disappears in a puff of smoke. Naruto's shadow clone takes in his words and heads off to the original to hand him the bells. Hidden Leaf Academy The ceremony has been altered slightly over the years. Before, it used to be more of a personal affair, involving only the students and their teacher. These days, it's a bit more formal. The ceremony for assigning teams and their sensei now takes place outside, in front of the academy. Principal Aruka Yamino stands on a podium, with the Jonin sensei to be standing in a line behind him, to address everyone gathered. In front of him are all of the graduating classes, lined up in rows of three behind their teachers. Tenton, while usually wearing his typical white and red dress while teaching, has donned the standard shinobi uniform for this occasion. Standing a bit behind each class are more clusters of kids. These, however, are much younger, all about five or six years old. The next classes that are going to enter the academy once this group graduates. The passing of the torch, so to speak, where the kids can see what they have to look forward to. Among one of the groups, the one directly behind Tenton's class are Mirai Saratobi and Tama Hagane, ready and eager to start learning. Behind them are the family and friends of the kids present, all gathered to cheer for the future protectors of their village. As Aruka stands in front of everyone, he can't help but smile at how much more social this event has gotten. It feels so much grander, and everyone involved seems more excited when it's done this way, like they can feel just how important the moment is. Still, that doesn't change his nervousness in addressing this many people. He looks to the side to find himself some courage, and does when his eyes meet Shizune and Shihei. The young boy wildly waves to his dad, while Shizuna gives him a thumbs up. You got this. She mouths to him. Taking a deep breath, Aruka turns to the crowd and begins. I'd like to start by saying just how proud I am of each and every one of you. You've all shown exceptional growth and have continuously impressed myself and your teacher, and I know you've only scratched the surface of what you can do. You live in an era unlike any other, an era of peace and cooperation, of trust and friendship. It was a hard-fought battle to reach this point, but I'd like to think it was well worth it. I hope you can continue to bring prosperity to this world and build upon what we've started as the future of the Hidden Leaf Village. It is with great honor that I officially announce you as Shinobi. Everyone gathered cheers, the applause resounding for a solid minute before dying down. Naruto wipes away a tear and leans over to Shino who stood next to him. Man, that was great. You must compose yourself, Naruto. Why, you ask? Because the eyes of the future generations are on us now. It's our duty now to show them our very best side. Yeah, yeah. I know. Now, Haruka continues. You teachers will announce your Jonin leaders. The sensei of the first class, Tenten, steps forward before turning around to face her students with a proud smile. She lists off the members that will comprise each team, although that's more of a formality, since the kids are already in a row with their teammates, and then announces their new Jonin sensei. Whoever gets called out, steps down from the podium and walks over to the group to stand next to their Genin. Team 5, Tenten announces, Kashiwama Senju. Genzai Saratobi. Juriki Hyuga. Your Jonin leader is Shino Aburama. Kashiwama wears a green and brown jacket, with his forehead protector instead being a hapuri, a plate that surrounds like face, just as the one worn by the second Hakage. Genzai wears a simply dark attire with protective plates that cover the entire outside part of his arms and legs. Juriki wears simple beige and gray loose clothing, for the mobility he needs. Shino steps forward, nodding a see you later to Naruto, and goes toward his team. You guys know him? Kashiwama whispers to his friends. Heir to the Aburama clan. Juriki answers. And Lady Hinata's former teammate. Whoa, you know a lot, Juriki. Kashiwama sounds impressed. Juriki's eye twitches. Better yet, you're a clan heir, too, why don't you know this? Kashiwama just shrugs in response just as Shino arrives next to them. In his usual to-the-point style, Shino nods a greeting to his team and stands at attention as the other teams are announced. Tenten continues to announce the teams from her class, before reaching Team 9. Katori Uzumaki. Yakamaru Kagatsu. Shoto Teshin. Your Jonin leader is Naruto Uzumaki. There's a good few whispers and murmurs at Naruto's presence, even some kids voicing disappointment that they weren't assigned the hero of the war. 
Many, though, knew from long ago that this is what this particular team will look like. When Naruto joins his kids, he bumps fists with each other and takes his place by their side. Katori's practically hopping in place from excitement. I can't wait. This is gonna be awesome. Naruto chuckles. You bet. When Tenten finishes reading, she stands in front of the jonin who are lined up behind each other and bows to them, and they bow to her. With that, she remains in position while the other classes also announce their teams. At the end, the group switch places. The last students of this year make way for the first students of the next. The genin step back while the five-year-olds who will enter the academy step to the front to meet their future teachers, with Mirai and Tama falling into Tenten's class. Katori enthusiastically waves to the girls as they pass each other. Iruka looks over the kids whose excitement has seemingly skyrocketed. And you carry on what they will build. I hope you will help each other and support each other to build a better future. With the ceremony over, Katori immediately runs over to the kids and gives Mirai and Tama a big hug. You look really cool. Mirai exclaims. Right? Katori grins and spins around. It's pretty awesome. Are we gonna be cool shinobi like you? Tama questions. You're gonna be even cooler. Genzai walks over to them, as well, ruffling his cousin's short hair. You're gonna cause trouble for Tenten sensei right? Of course not. Mirai says, fixing her hair. We'll be the best in class. Right, Tama? Yeah. Tama nods vigorously. I won't let you down. She looks up to Katori, not once forgetting what an impact her regular visits to the orphanage made, and showing how strong one can be no matter where they came from. I know you won't. Katori pulls her into another tight hug before finally breaking away to return to her team. Along the way, she high-fives Kashiwama. To the side, all the parents are gathered with proud looks on their faces. Hinata has taken a spot by Kurinai's side as both their daughters take in the atmosphere. Mirai's already gotten so big, I can hardly believe it. Hinata notes. You think you're surprised? Kurinai laughs. How do you think I feel? It really doesn't feel like five years have passed, and yet here we are. The following years will pass even faster. Tosaku says with a laugh as he and Fusuma approach. It's a very sobering feeling, seeing our babies all grown. Fusuma chuckles. You'll see it soon enough, Kurinai. To the side, Yakamaru and Shoto's families also observe the ceremony, with Yoi holding her hand tightly against her chest. You look worried, Yoi. Asami notes. Are you not? Our kids will go out and potentially risk their lives on dangerous missions. And they'll have Naruto to help them. Asami reassures her. Besides, from my understanding, it'll be a while before they're given any missions that involve danger. I suppose you're right. Gurin places a comforting hand on Yoi's shoulder. You don't need to worry. That boy is stronger and smarter than even he realizes. They'll do just fine. The families watch as all of the newly formed teams disperse, disappearing from in a single flicker. Team Shino Going to a more secluded location, the newly formed Team 5 stands at attention while Shino faces them all. As Aruka sensei said, this is a new era we live in, and there will be certain expectations of you. They may not always seem reasonable or fair, but they are ones you will be required to meet for the sake of a better world. Yes, Shino sensei. All three of them answer. Now, I want you to tell me, what role do you see for yourself within this team? He first points to Kashiwama. Kashiwama send you. Ninjutsu is my forte. With earth style and water style I can change the battlefield to our advantage, and if anyone gets hurt, I can provide cover while healing. Shino nods. Ideally, you will stay back and not put yourself in as much risk to allow for better maneuvering to anyone who needs your support. Then, Genzai Saratobi. He points to him next. I'm good with both Taijutsu and Ninjutsu. So I can stay back for support or go to the front as needed. I can also use my clan's summoning for additional support or even scouts. Excellent. Such versatility will be key for our missions. Jiriki Hyuga. I excel in Taijutsu as any Hyuga would. With my Byakugan, I can scout ahead of up to 100 meters. I'm also proficient with Kaiwajutsu for longer range combat. Shino raises his brow from beneath his glasses. Kaiwajutsu? The usage of bows? I don't believe I've seen a Hyuga use one before. Yes sir. Jiriki opens a small storage scroll strapped to his clothes and summons forth its contents, a tall and lean wooden bow, about Jiriki's height, appearing in his hand. Jiriki traces a finger on the jutsu formulae engraved onto it, revealing them to also be storage seals for arrows. I see. That's a very interesting skill set and one that will serve us well. I've been informed you three have been friends for years and thus familiar enough with each other's presence. However, you are not familiar with mine. 
we will train to devise formations that can make use of our combined efforts to their maximum efficiency. That's because we cannot allow ourselves to be outmatched by Team 9. His jacket billows as his insects buzz from excitement. Jiriki clicks his tongue. Like that would happen. All right, Kashiwama pumps his fist. It's a sprint to see which team can do better. I'll show Katori what an awesome ninja I am. Genzai sighs in defeat. Our sensei has a competitive spirit. I was afraid of this. Team Naruto Naruto takes his team to a very specific rooftop of a nearby building. When the village was rebuilt following Pain's attack, some locations were restored to match their previous appearance in an attempt to keep some familiarity to the leaf rather than everything just being completely different. This particular building is a resting spot of sorts, having some trees planted on the side resting under a large archway that provides shade for anyone who wants to sit in this little green haven in the middle of the city. This is the restored building where Team 7 had their very first meeting. Naruto leans on the railing just as Kakashi did so so many years ago, while the kids sit on the steps as they did. So here we are. Finally. He mutters to himself. So what are we doing first, Dad? Katori asks, swinging her legs. You know, Katori, Naruto leans back and crosses his arms, doing his best to look as authoritative as he can. Now that we're an official four-man cell, you really ought to start calling me sensei. Understood, Dad Sensei. She salutes. Naruto slumps his shoulder. Yeah, we'll. We'll work on that. Yakamaru looks over Naruto's attire. It's not really at all different from what he wore before. Standard leaf uniform with arm guards and a horned forehead protecting, and the orange cloak he started donning after they came back. The one thing that's different is something hanging from his waist, jingling as the wind picks up. Um, Sensei? Yakamaru points to the accessory tied to his belt. What are the bells for? Ah, these? Naruto takes them off and looks them over one more time in his palm. They're a gift of sorts from my sensei. Kakashi? Shoto cocks his head. Why would he give you bells? Ha, huh, you see, he used these as a kind of a trick test after we graduated. He tried to get us to turn on each other by making us think it was a survival of the fittest kind of thing. Should you be telling us that? Yakamaru asks. So I take it you're not going to have us do that? Kakashi-sensei had us go through a test before he accepted us as a team. The point was to get us to work as a team and realize that we can't do things alone. And if we didn't, we didn't deserve to be shinobi. He closes his hand, putting the bells back in his pocket. But I don't need to do that with you three, do I? We've been through a lot together and we're only just beginning. I know just how strong you three are and you know each other's styles inside and out. We don't need a test to know we're the strongest there is. He grins. So. Why don't we just start, eh? Yes, Dad Sensei. Yes, Sensei. Yes, Shisho. Hidden Cloud Village Samui leans against a railing overlooking the many windy mountains of the cloud. She takes in a deep breath and looks over her three students. With her previous team now having all made Chuanan, one even making it to Jonan, she's free to take on a new team of Genan. The team she specifically requested, the best way she can show her thanks to Naruto for showing her this path in her life. She looks over to Takai who's sitting still at first glance, but a closer look would reveal the joy in her gaze, to Heiai who's leaning back with one leg raised, and to Kitsui who's practically jumping from excitement with a smile. Are you prepared for what's to come? Of course. Kitsui slams his fist in his palm. I've never been more ready. We've all got our goals, Samui sensei. Hei's usual laid-back tone hides beneath it an enthusiasm to match Kitsui's. We're gonna do whatever it takes. I really hope, Takai looks down to her clenched fist, that we can see Katori again. Samui nods to the girl. It's good to want to meet up again, but remember. We're doing this for more than just happy reunions. When next you meet, it may very well be as a rival you'll have to fight against. I'm ready for that, sensei. Takai declares in a certain tone that her younger self didn't possess. When we see each other, it'll be so I can show her how much I've grown. And you'll grow even more. Samui says. Believe me when I say, any training you've done until now will be child's play. So I hope you can keep your cool. Yes ma'am. They all say in unison. Although, Takai begins, didn't you just have a baby, sensei? Is it alright for you to be our team's leader? Samui gives a light smile at the girl's concern. Thank you for asking, Takai, but it's fine. My dear husband and I figured things out to make this work. The three of you are the very reason I chose to be a Jonin leader in the first place. Taking you to great heights is what I must do and want to do. And we won't let you down. Kitsui states. 
I know you won't, Samui says. So before we begin anything mission related, why don't you show me how much you've grown? What do you want us to do? Hey I asks. Samui pulls out her tanto blade she carries on her back and presents it to them. Catch this tanto. They all stare at it in silence for a bit. That's all? Kitsui cocks his head. Yes. That's all. Samui throws it off the cliff behind her without even looking. So, I'll ask again. Are you prepared? She stops mid-sentence when all three of them, without a hint of hesitation, leap onto the railing beside her and jump after the tanto. Well, aren't you three all cool? She chuckles. Samui disappears from her spot and flickers right next to the blade, way ahead of the kids who blink in surprise. She throws the tanto in a different direction and disappears again. With a loud thud, Takai lands on a small cliff on the side, nearly breaking it off. So we're playing catch? Looks like it. Kitsui is already running after it, sticking to the walls with his chakra. But it's more than just playing. He observes. This exact scenario is. Yes. Takai runs along the walls after him. It's just like back then. Heiai chuckles and darts off, as well, lightning emanating from his legs. This is gonna be groovy. Hidden Rain Village Conan walks along with Fayu by her side through the corridors of a particular tower, boots echoing on the metal floor through winding corridors. Both wear the new standard rain uniform of a long coat under a flak jacket. Fayu, as in her youth, has a long fringe hiding half of her face and an umbrella on her back. Thank you for this honor, Lady Conan. Fayu says with a hint of nervousness in her voice. You've continuously shown yourself as a capable and trustworthy ally, Fayu. You're one of the people I trust the most to raise the future generation. Then again, I may be biased, given who's on your team. Conan smiles. I promise I won't let you down. Conan shakes her head with a chuckle at Fayu's obvious stiffness. You don't have to be so nervous. I'm not the person I used to be, you speak to me normally. Perhaps I should have just stayed back today. She wonders how she could cause less discomfort at the people who still remember her as the angel. No. Fayu says in a much louder and panicked voice than she intended. I mean. No, I didn't mean to worry you. My apologies. Then, do you have any questions regarding your team? No ma'am. Fayu shakes her head. The academy reports provided everything I need for now. The rest will be up to them. Then, I shall leave you to it. Conan begins to disperse, her entire body turning into sheets of paper that fly through a nearby window. Best of luck to you. She says just before her head turns into papers. Fayu breathes in deeply to prepare herself from what's to come. She continues to walk down the corridor before going through a door leading into a balcony, having to shield herself from the sun that mercilessly assaults her after just leaving a dark corridor. There, she's met by her team of Genin, the kids she'll be in charge for the next couple of years at best. A huge responsibility that she'd otherwise feel wholly unprepared for, but when the person you admire the most puts their trust in you, it's difficult to refuse. In front of her are a boy and two girls, all dressed in the similar robes that Conan put into place for the village after her return, although some have their own little additions. The boy of purple hair is currently bringing origami to life to pass time, his hands seemingly made of multiple colored papers, as opposed to Conan's white. One girl has curly dark blue hair and an umbrella on her back. The other girl has her hair hidden under a bandana and her mouth covered in a rebreather, a metallic and seemingly makeshift gauntlet on her left arm. They both seem invested in the boy's display, giving off a relaxed atmosphere. She feels a weight lifted off her shoulders. At least the kids seem to not mind each other's presence, so that's a plus. Fayu clears her throat to get their attention. Mutsu. The boy calls the papers back to his hand and stands at attention. Samater. The girl with the umbrella bows. Teru. The girl with the rebreather nods. My name is Fayu and I'll be your Jonin sensei as of today. Hello. Mutsu gives a warm smile. I'm glad you were assigned to us. Fayu chuckles. Don't think that means you'll have an easy time. Is it true? Teru speaks, her voice altered by the rebreather, that you're in. Lady Conan's circle? She asks in a slow voice. I suppose you could call it that. I've been entrusted to shape you into the bright future of the hidden rain. I've been told you've all done exceptionally well so far, so I know you get grow even further. Oh my Samater twirls her curly hair. One of Lady Conan's trusted and her son? Such an honor. She spins in place on the tip of her boots. Her voice is slightly exaggerated, but there doesn't actually seem to be any sarcasm to it. She stops spinning and opens her umbrella while propped on her shoulder. Very well, then. I shall be your charming heroine. Ours will be a story most memorable. She latches onto Matsu's arm. Um, I hope so, too, 
Matsu laughs nervously. All right then. Fayu blinks at Samiter's apparent eccentricities. Samiter leans forward to look at Teru. You don't mind if I take the lead role, do you? No. Teru answers simply. Excellent. Sumiter clasped her hands with a bright smile. So, Fayu slightly raises her voice to bring back order. How about we see how well you three will work as a team? Yes, Fayu sensei. They say in unison with various degrees of energy. Hidden Sand Village when Sen was presented with the opportunity to be a Jonin sensei, she wasn't entirely sure what to make of it. On one hand, it was a great honor, especially since it seems the fifth Kazukage and Kankuro personally considered her for the role. On the other hand, it's a great deal of responsibility. After a few days of mulling it over and a few conversions with her friends, especially Ameno who had some experience with classroom teaching, she decided to give it a go. Graduation day, she stands in front of her three genin in attire not too dissimilar to the red dress and mesh shirt she's always worn. It covers a bit more for added protection, but has otherwise kept her style. She tried on the new flak jackets, and while they're sleeker and easier to wear, it's still not her style. All right, she claps her hands with an enthusiastic smile, my name is Sen, and I'll be your jonin commander for the foreseeable future. While I'm skilled in all areas of combat, Genjutsu is my specialty, so you can trust me to have you covered on that front. She gives them a playful wink. So why don't you tell me a bit about yourselves? One girl immediately darts to her feet. Her sandy blonde hair reaching just under her chin, she wears a loose outside, kept in place by wrappings around her arms and feet, along with a piece of cloth around her waist. On her back, she carries a large scroll. I'm Teori. She proudly declares with her hands on her hips. I use binding cloth so I'm really good at immobilizing targets, but the cloth's got a lot of other uses, too. She pats the scroll on her back. Sen nods. That's a really versatile tool, useful in almost any situation. She looks to the other girl on the team. She stands up, brown hair tied in a braid that onto her light gray robe that reaches down to her ankles, a slit on the side allowing her to move her legs more freely, and dark pants. She slams a giant folding fan by her side. Taiko. I'm a Tessin fan wind style user. There's little that can withstand my jutsu. And finally, she looks to the boy of the group. Dressed in a dark outfit that covers his entire body, hands covered in dark fingerless gloves, the boy's long hair is tied up in a ponytail with his fringe covering part of his face. He has several scroll pouches on his outfit and carries a particular round disc-shaped backpack. I'm Sanjin. I make and use puppets. I only have two right now but I really hope I can make many more to leave behind for the future. His gentle smile somehow heightens his soft features, making him look more feminine. But you can't use that other one, you got that? Teori reminds him in a harsh tone. Under no circumstances are you to use it, eh? But it's, Sanjin tries to protest. I said no, Teori puffs her cheeks and crosses her arms. Now, now, Sen intervenes. If Sanjin has something that can save our butts on a mission, we should make use of it. There's many times out there that we won't be able to afford holding back. All right? Teori just turns her head. Yes, Sensei. Sanjin nods. Seriously, what's the big deal? Taiko raises a brow. None of your business. Teori states, getting right up in Taiko's face. And don't you think us being a team gives you an excuse to get close to Sanjin? All right, geez. Taiko pushes her away. Wasn't planning to. Sen hops to her feet and approaches the kids. Before we get to doing any big missions, I want us to practice how well we'll work as a team. She holds out her hand, palm facing downward, when she gets to them. I get the feeling we're gonna make a great team. Teori places her hand over their senseis, then Sanjin, and finally Taiko. Yes, Sen Sensei. They say in unison as they raise their hands high with a cheer. Hidden Mist Village Saizo Kairan, one of only two current member of the Seven Ninja Swordsmen of the Mist, has been tasked with the important task of teaching and grooming the future of the village. He'd arranged for them to meet by a lake in one of the nearby parks. Well, not specifically arranged, but left clues as to where they can find them, and hopefully they can prove they can figure out a simple treasure hunt. One of his genin is Bunton, a girl he's been personally training for a while now. She might be able to tap into Saizo's thought process and solve it, although the other two aren't pushovers, either. They can't afford to be. As Saizo waits for a few more minutes, sitting in the middle of the lake while he does, his genin appear through the tree lines. Bunton Kurosuki. He looks to his student. Hibayachigo. He addresses a girl with bushy curtain-like hair that frames an eerily calm smile. 
Ichiroda on Yuzu. He turns to the tall boy with his gray hair parted to the side. Well done. Bunton throws several pieces of paper into the lake. We did your silly test. Silly, is it? Saizo chuckles. Well, I suppose I did take it easy on the first day. Ichirauta smugly flicks his hair. Anything thrown at us, we'll handle with ease. Hibaichigo steps forward, looking her teacher directly in the eyes, and smiles. What's our next mission, sensei? Next, we prepare you for war. Saizo declares with a cold tone. So, a fifth voice speaks up from the ether, these are the ones you place your faith into, Saizo Kairin. A figure just behind Saizo steps into existence, as if exiting a mirage. A man with a blank mask and no identifying features. How do preparations go? Takeshi Imori asks. Yes, this is them. Saizo says directly, not even flinching at the sudden appearance of the man. And preparations go as planned. The bloody mist stands with the mountain. He declares. Excellent. Takeshi's form begins fading away as he looks at the kids. We look forward to your growth. Hidden Mountain Village Mizushi Asui stands ready in front of his new genin. He takes off the turtle shell from his back and embeds it in the ground in front of him, using it to lean on. Daoji Ibaraki. He addresses the first genin, a girl with a somewhat odd appearance. For starters, she's much larger and much more muscular than your average 12-year-old. Her skin is also a light shade of red, with her hair being a darker shade of red, with two horns protruding from her forehead just above her forehead protector. Hi Nekamata. By far the most ordinary looking of the bunch with a dark bob cut, hair the same black color as the feline next to her. Larger and bulkier than an average cat, this one looks like miniature panther. Onryu. The third is a solemn looking boy. Blank eyes quietly stare at the ground, his wit hair falling over his even paler face. He barely acknowledges that he's being addressed. The girl with the oni appearance clicks her tongue. So I'm to pass as an Ibaraki? You are an Ibaraki. Mizushi notes. You just need to take on your mother's clan name for the time being. Remember, Lord Kaitamaru has been biding his time since before he was your age and has gotten us to a position where we can finally strike. His judgment has not led us astray yet. Then why aren't we striking? She growls in frustration. Hayu sneers as she pets her panther companion. Such mistrust in our leader. Mizushi sensei, can the Ibaraki clan really be trusted to wait? I know Daoji is half Ibaraki, but that half seems very dominant. You dare doubt me, Hayu. Daoji stands up and slams her fist into the wall behind her, leaving a sizable crack. Watch yourself. Every word you've said so far is reason for doubt. Hayu leans back, unfazed by the other girl's monstrous strength. Mizushi stands between them with his turtle shell shield. That's enough, you two. Remember what our goal is. Hayu, Kuga has a high opinion of you as the future of the Nekamata clan. Your skills have impressed everyone in the village. Eyes are on you, so be mindful of that. Daoji, you've inherited the Ibaraki's strongest traits, only made more powerful by your father's bloodline. Hone your skills and one day you will stand by Lord Kaitamaru's side as one of his strongest. Yes, sensei. They both begrudgingly put a stop to their bickering. Throughout this entire confrontation, Anryu remains as silent as a ghost. You will face many opponents, and even more so once Lord Kaitamaru's plans come to fruition. I advise you to remember who our enemies are. End of chapter 62. End of part 1.5. Name meanings. Samater. Equals early summer rain. Teru. Equals named after Teru Teru Bozu, a paper cloth doll hanged to prevent heavy rain. Taiko. Equals named after Taiko drums. Along with the shamisen and tae, they're used in binraku, traditional puppet performances. Daoji Ibaraki. Equals named after the Oni Ibaraki Doji. Doji in this context means demon child. Hayu Nekamata. Equals leopard, panther. Onryu. Equals vengeful spirit. Trivia. Bunton, Ichiroda, and Hibayachigo are from the school trip arc, Baruto. Naruto Next Generations, Episodes 25 to 32. Chapter 63, Shinobi Files Katori Uzumaki Ninja Registration 012961 Chakra Nature Wind, Affinity Age, 13 Date of Birth, March 21, Aries Blood Type, B Height, 151.7 cm Weight 49 kilograms. Hobbies, bird watching. 
Wishes to fight. Everyone. Favorite food. Ramen. Least favorite food. Cabbage. Favorite phrase. Sar hai. Academy grades. Ninjutsu. A. Genjutsu. B. Taijutsu. C. Cooperation. A. Positivity. A. Yakamaru Kagatsu. Ninja registration. 012968. Chakra nature. Fire, affinity, earth, water, crystal, keke tota. Age. 12. Date of birth. September 3, Virgo. Blood type. A. Height. 148.8 centimeters. Weight. 48 kilograms. Hobbies. Geology. Wishes to fight. Gurin. Favorite food. Anything his mom makes. Least favorite food. Spicy foods. Favorite phrase. Thank you. Academy grades. Ninjutsu. A. Genjutsu. C. Taijutsu. B. Cooperation. B. Positivity. C. Shoto Teshin. Ninja Registration. 012965. Chakra Nature. Earth Affinity. Age. 12. Date of Birth. November 10, Scorpius. Blood Type. 0. Height. 153.2 cm. Weight. 54 kg. Hobbies. Training. Wishes to fight. The Huga Clan. Favorite food. Miso soup. Least favorite food. Natto. Favorite phrase. Spirit first, technique second. Academy grades. Ninjutsu. B. Genjutsu. C. Taijutsu. A. Cooperation. D. Positivity. D. Kashiwama Senju. Ninja Registration. 012960. Chakra Nature. Water, Affinity, Earth. Age. 13. Date of Birth. May 5, Taurus. Blood Type. B. Height. 157.4 cm. Weight. 56 kg. Hobbies. Bonsai tending, baking. Wishes to fight. Naruto Uzumaki and Sasuke Achiha in a 2v1 fight of the millennium. Favorite food. Wagashi. Least favorite food. Tsukimono. Favorite phrase. Together. Academy grades. Ninjutsu. A. Genjutsu. C. Taijutsu. B. Cooperation. A. Positivity. A. Genzai Saratobi. Ninja Registration. 012970. Chakra Nature. Fire, Affinity. Age. 13. Date of Birth. May 9, Taurus. Blood Type. 0. Height. 150.2 centimeters. Weight. 50 kilograms. Hobbies. Mountain climbing. Wishes to fight. No one in particular. Favorite food. Onigiri. Least favorite food. Jelly filled donuts. Favorite phrase. Even monkeys fall from trees. Academy grades. Ninjutsu. A. Genjutsu. C. Taijutsu. A. Cooperation. B. Positivity. D. Juriki Hyuga. Ninja Registration. 012964. Chakra Nature. Lightning. Affinity. Age. 12. Date of Birth. July 3. Cancer. Blood Type. A. B. Height. 154.9 centimeters. 
Weight. 53 kilograms. Hobbies. Calligraphy. Wishes to fight. Anyone strong. Favorite food. Natto. Least favorite food. Miso soup. Favorite phrase. One stroke, two halves. Academy grades, ninjutsu, B. Genjutsu, B. Taijutsu, A. Cooperation, F. Positivity, F. End of chapter 63.